Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a good Thursday to you. And thank you for joining us again on the show on SportsNetUSA.net. I am Corey Nayland. Also with me, as always, Mark Pavlovich in your upper box. Ed Ford, making sure we do get up on the air, making sure we, you do hear us as we get on another Thursday. Usually we discuss community college athletics. Since this is a sports show, we also like to discuss other aspects of sports. And today's discussion is going to be an interesting, it's going to be a good one, one that we've been looking forward to all week. And I'm a little bit too excited because I was, I was telling Mark last night, I don't know what to ask or how to, I don't, let me rephrase that, I don't know how to ask the questions I want to ask because there's just so much going on in my mind because we are joined by Dr. Alan Levy, PhD, Professor of History from Slippery Rock University. And we're going to be discussing his book, this book right here, Tackling Jim Crow, Racial Segregation in Professional Football. Good book, read it, and I knew what I wanted to ask before I read the book. I read the book, and now everything is just, there's so much I want to get into, and I cannot formulate it. So, Mark, why don't you start us off, take us where we need to go, and I'll catch up with both of you. And Alan, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Well, Corey, you know, I always like to have our people at home discover who our guest is. Uh, Alan, most people don't know you. They don't know about your book. So let's go into your background, where you originally came from, where you went to college at, where you're at now, and the reason for writing the book. Sure. My background... I'm a, I'm a history professor, and my background that feeds into sports history is that uh, I grew up mainly in, in the Baltimore area. I was a big fan of the uh, of the Baltimore Colts, and that lies in back of some of the passion that I brought from childhood into some of the things that I researched, including this book. Uh, in school, I went to uh, Washington and Jefferson College in Pennsylvania, undergraduate, and then did my master's and PhD at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and became involved, of course, then in historic, in research, taught at several universities. And in 1985, a long time ago, in 1985, I got a job here in, at Slippery Rock University that's part of the Pennsylvania State University system. And I've been here with some leave time, I've been here ever since. And uh, people ask me, why'd you get into sports? One short answer is tenure, uh, always a nice thing. <laughs> now, I can, now I can do what I want. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a nice nice feeling of security. And so whenever I have, ch have chances, I have books on sports now in my life. And so when I have time, I always go to Washington, which is only five hours away, and I have the Library of Congress and all its extensive collections. And so I've researched various topics. In regard to the book itself, what uh, fascinated me was simply the fact that the history of Jackie Robinson in baseball, the whole story of racial seg segregation and desegregation in baseball, has been well researched, but when I began thinking about this book, which I first started to draw resources back in the 1990s, there had been very, very little written about it. So it just seemed such an obvious counterpart of Jackie Robinson's story in the area of football. And so that's what I began to focus on. And the rest just came spilling out, much as thoughts came to your, your mind, Corey. Much the same happened with me as I researched this. Is it, so much. What was football like in the 19th century? What happened in the early 20th century? What happened when the NFL was formed? And the various stages, the 20s, the 30s, each one opens up a new phase. And each stage is part of, the, part of the overall development that we've all inherited and we're still, still wrestling with. And why do you think that there wasn't that much research on, on the subject of racial segregation in football as opposed to and I know you get that into that into the book, as opposed to in baseball. Well, in baseball, you had a situation, particularly before the 1950s, where there were, aside from episodes, you know, when there's the Kentucky Derby sport, horse racing is, of course, a big, a big sport. When, when there is a boxing involving a Joe Lewis or a Muhammad Ali, in those episodic moments, boxing is big. But day in, day out, before the 1950s, Sport came close to rivaling baseball. There was very, there was no professional basketball to speak of in any major sense until 1946, 
and that took time to become to become sizable. And hockey was time six teams until the late 1960s. And football really took time because the NFL was tiny until the until the years after World War II, and didn't become really preeminent until the 1950s and beyond. So for that reason, the story just doesn't have the same breadth of impact, but it's still worth telling. So that uh, I don't think there's been an intentional disregarding of it. It just took a little time for historians to catch the record up, if you will, with where the public's mind was. Professor, I, I, I think the thing that's interesting about football is when you look at it when it originally started, the Association of Professional Football allowed black players to play when it first started going. Right. And this is even Jim Crow even existed at that time. But they did. When you think of jo Charlie Follis, who was the first uh, player to play in professional football, the American Pro Football Association. Down the road, though, when the NFL came into existence, the NFL took, when they had black players, then banned black players. And my big question here is that Jim Crow existed, pro football allowed them in, and then there was that period that the NFL went, before we even get the players went, we're going to take players that we've had in the league, and disband them. So where did this ideology come from to get rid of black players who have already been in professional football? Well, there's a couple of stages. Here. First off, I would phrase it a little differently. There wasn't so much an allowing of African-American football, so much as there wasn't a, there was a lack of disallowing, simply because the league was still organized so loosely that there was really no control that any one organization or any figure could exercise over a team. Indeed, through, through the 1920s, all through this time of pro football, week in, week out, you didn't know who you were going to play. It was all completely made up on the spot. We play next week. I don't know. We'll find out. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the season, indeed, well, in, well through the 1920s, there was always dispute at the end of the season, well, who, who deserves to be the champion? And different teams, we do, we do. There, was no, there, were, there were no playoffs. There was no, no organization. So it was more simply that the league was totally disorganized and uh, and haphazard. It was tiny compared to football. And then so the next step comes, why did pro football then be become segregated it did at the end of the 1933 season? And uh, a very obvious reason, you can't ignore it, obviously, is that many of the owners, particularly Mr. George Preston, of the team that's now called the Washington Football, a team that he bought that was at that time Braves, drawing upon the, the fame that the baseball had, where the Braves at that point played baseball. He bought the Braves, turned them into the Boston Redskins, and was interested in marketing them as a team of the South and of the teams of the National Football League. When he moved them to Washington, he called them the Washington Redskins, as he had in Boston. Press, George Preston Marshall was a Southerner in all the bad sense of that, that that means in the 1920s and 30s. And he wanted to market the Redskins as a team of the South. He wanted popularity. There were no teams in Carolina, Georgia, Florida, New Orleans. Back then, Washington was the team. He wanted to have fan following in Roanoke, Norfolk. And he did it by emphasizing his own team that there would be no African-American players. And he held that until the early 1960s. Beyond that, he persuaded members of the league who went along with him classic story of what the historian C. Van Woodward, when he wrote The Strange Career of Jim Crow, a book that Dr. King calls the historical Bible of the, of the civil rights movement. But the, uh, the, the process, Mr. Woodward talks about capitulation. Why do good people do bad things? Because the worst does something and they don't want to make waves, and so they go along with it. So all the a lot of the famous owners, Art Rooney, George Hallis, they became very popular with their African-American players later on. 1960s and beyond. But at that point, they simply went along with the idea. Capitulation is a theme. And there, were, there was the idea also that beyond simple racism and marketing, that in the, in the case of the Depression, owners argued among themselves and made clear among, at least to the point of convincing one another, 
that the idea of seeing an African-American on the field implied to some of the fans in the stand, there's somebody who has a job that would otherwise go to Will we be able to sell tickets under such a circumstance? Even if the answer was no, the point was made among a small group of owners, and the worst among them, like Marshall, made the point most, most vehemently. And the rest of them, as I said, the, the key word uh, that Mr. Woodward uses so eloquently, the rest of them capitulated. Right. That's, that, to me, is the, is, the, is the primary answer. And then from there on, there lies a level of denial. Mr. Hallis, and, among others, said, just tried to always claim for years, we just didn't know about these African players. They may have been there, but we didn't know about them. It's total nonsense. <laughs> and, and let's circle back to that. Let, let's go from the beginning, just off that statement, they didn't know about those players, and then get back to Hallis and Rooney, because I found it interesting reading the book about how revered they came or how beloved they became later on. So those players that they didn't know about, um, I, and one in particular, Char you mentioned Charlie Drew in your first chapter, is the same tr Dr. Charles Drew. Dr. Who, Drew. Who, and so I, I found that amazing. Who were some of the players um, besides Charles Drew and the Fritz Pollers that you know have recognition that many don't really know about in the early days? Right. Well, especially when the, as I say, when the when the curtain comes down, and Mr. Hallis said, we didn't know about African American players. There were several very talented and extremely well covered college football players. Jerome Holland was an example. Brook Holland was Brook was his nickname. He played for Cornell, and back then the Ivy League was big time. He was a star running back with with Cornell, and so he got headlines in the New York Times. For goodness sakes, now. If Scouts were in any way attuned to what was going on. They obviously read the New York Times. And so Mr. Hall is saying that Bert Holland is not, was not, uh, is just simply preposterous. Holland, by the way, has, I didn't go into this as terribly much in the book. Holland has a fascinating history because, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger kind of attitude. Holland couldn't play pro football. So he went and got a PhD in economics. He taught at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He taught and then became president of the Hampton Institute or Hampton University in Washington. Became Delaware State University, and from 1970 to 1972 was American ambassador to Sweden. So oh, wow, okay, the least. yeah, because that, yeah, that's 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 pretty amazing. So much for that that nonsense of not being a student athlete. I but, mean, <laughs> and I can name you some others that were pretty obvious. Uh, Ozzy Simmons, for example, played at the University of and there's Hallis, the owner of the Bears. He, Simmons was an All American in Iowa, and he got headlines in the Chicago Tribune. We know Hallis never read the Chicago Tribune, of course. I mean, he lives in Chicago. And Bernard Jefferson was another who was a, who was a wide receiver with Northwestern, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. How close do you have to be in Chicago right. and not be known for Mr. Hallis? So, he, you know, he was just talking out of, the, out of both sides of his mouth. And he, he couldn't have been more obvious in his dishonesty. But he was trying to rationalize what he knew couldn't be, uh, couldn't be hidden. Right. Other players besides a famous famous quarterback quarterback named who had an Asian name Indian name of Vilmat Sadat Singh was uh, was born in Harlem was an orphan but his family moved to New York and they adopted him as a baby and grew up with the name Vilmat Sadat Singh played high school ball but with the, with the name many didn't realize until he got on the field that he was African American so he played for Syracuse and played quarterback. and again the name didn't denote anything. And so once the team went down to the University of Maryland to play against against the university in, in College Park, Maryland, the state of Maryland at that point had laws forbidding black from playing on the same field. So that they, the coach of Syracuse had to be told, your quarterback can't play. Coach made the decision to play the game without him. He could have walked off the field. So they played, they lost. But the next year, Maryland's turn to come up to Syracuse. Then local law applied. With Bill Met Sidat Singh playing, final score, Syracuse 53, Maryland 10. Take that, Maryland. And uh, Grantland Rice, no less, covered the game. And so the NFL had to know about him. Right. And in and the saying story that, that, the. Uh, Go ahead. I, I was just going to add to I was That's OK, Doctor. The, the thing I wanted to add to it, because I, I know we talk about pro football, but we, we've started this with. Jim Crow and segregation in pro football. And, and I'm really weird. I sort of find this strange correlation to what's been going on in the country in the last few years. And then we bring up Jim Crow today. 
So when we talk about segregation through the collegiate ranks to the professional ranks, how much of it was a not recognizing somebody like Corey Nealon for a political reason, or was it not recognizing somebody like Corey Nealon because we had been taught our entire lives that, hey, I don't care what they say about Corey, he's not superior to me, I'm never gonna let him be superior to me, I'm never gonna let anybody say, he's faster than Mark, stronger than Mark, or more athletic than Mark. Where was the political actually and the divide of the political and the athletic conversations? during football and the Jim Crow attitude that was in pro football and collegiate football? I think the the issue is that uh, the, the not only was the preeminence and existence of such athletes kept out, but those who were willing to engage the debate, like Mandel Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier or other writers for African Americans, they voiced issues their concerns more about baseball, of course, because of its visibility. That was pro that was of course target number one, integrate baseball. But the but the sport of football was also there to be discussed and looked at. And various writers with this with the African American press were certainly quite outspoken. But the point was those organs of the press were themselves out of the limelight as well. And the major press outlet wasn't television yet of any significance. Newsreels that theaters were completely controlled. I mean, back in the old days, you know, even Jack Johnson fighting were not allowed to be shown. And so those kinds of rules that surrounded the debate kept any logical debate from having a forum. I mean, the, 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 the existence of the obvious contradictions were there all along. Uh, but the fact was during World War II, the contradictions were still there. We were fighting a war against abroad with the Nazis. And yet the story that always made my students that is true that when Nazi troops were taken prisoner and brought on ships over to America in prisoner of war camps. Most of the camps were in the south, near army bases. And when they trained, came into the south, the black American troops that were guarding them had to get their seats on the railroad cars to conform to Jim Crow laws. So German POWs got precedence in seating over African American troops. I mean, when the situation is that blatant, then sports like football, et cetera, were comparatively sideshow, but if they wouldn't discuss one blatant area of racism, it was totally contradictory in regard to the war effort, or was simply way down the list, but the contradictions were there all along. And eventually, once you crack the door open, things will, will come forth, not automatically, and not without a lot of pain and a lot of resistance. But the story was very much tied to World War II from there. And, and after that, and after World War II, when things became, you know, that contradiction that couldn't be ignored. Um, who were some of the, the athletes, you know, well, and, well, since I read the book, I know, but tell our audience who some of those athletes were that were more, more outspoken to, to lead that effort. There were really four, I mean, Jackie Robinson was singular. Larry Doby came into the Cleveland Indians a couple of months later, he integrated the American League, but Jackie Robinson got all the headlines and he endured all the pressure. It was pretty, it was obviously, it was very, very difficult for him. In football, again, the visibility wasn't as great because the sport didn't have the command of public interest that baseball did. But there were two teams, four players, because there were two leagues at that point. The lesser league, just founded after World War II, was the originally called the All-America Conference. It would last four years, and some of the teams would merge thereafter. They tried, the All-America Conference tried, segregation among the owners, but the owner slash coach of the lead team of, the, of that, that conference, the, the Cleveland Browns, led by Paul Brown, simply wouldn't hear of it. Paul Brown, as one of the famous Jim Brown said, Paul Brown was not in any way a racial pioneer, but he was absolutely a no-nonsense person in terms of what he believed was a scientifically better way of coaching. And if you could do, if you could work within his system, he didn't care what race you were or, any, or anything else. Race, religion didn't mean a thing to him. And so if you could run the guards in a certain length of time, if you could uh, block the way he wanted you to block, if you could learn the playbook the way he wanted you to learn it, then you were, you were good. If you weren't, it didn't matter which, who you were also, you were cut. So Brown was one, one, one of the pioneers. Regarding. He brought in two important players who are now in the Hall of Fame. One was a lineman named Bill Willis, and the other was a running back, Marion Motley. So they integrated it in 1946. More visibly, 
in the NFL, the Cleveland Rams, as they had been called until not through 1945, the NFL champions that year. They were the first professional sports team to move to the West Coast. They became the Los Angeles Rams. And they hoped to fit in there and make good money because the gate would be larger, more population, fan interest, and it did work. But when they moved to the West Coast, activists in Los Angeles, as part of the NAACP and other organizations, began to put pressure on them. One that they raised was a very clever one, using the existing law of, of Plessy way back from 1896, that was still on the books before Brown versus Board of Education, that had put into practice the theory of, quote, separate but equal. The Rams were going to play in the LA Coliseum, still exists, that had been built in 1932 for the then Olympics of that year. It was a public, fu publicly funded stadium. And so the leader, some leaders in, in Los Angeles raised the point, well, if you've got this stadium for whites only, because if the Rams are, are, are a white team, then they could ask the logical question on, under the doctrine of separate but equal. Where is our stadium? All right. Are you going to spend the new stadium? And with, with that in mind, but even more in mind with the notion of Want, thought the Ram leaders, do we want to let the world know, and Los Angeles leaders themselves concurred with the point, we don't want to let the world know that moving to the West Coast is going to be problematic. We want it to be a smooth process, whoever comes out here. So when that pressure came up immediately, okay. And so they turned to two stars who had been popular in the, with the fans on the West Coast anyway, because they'd previously played with UCLA, with Jackie Robinson, actually. Their names were Kenny Washington and Woody Strode. And they're the two players who are the Jackie Robinsons of the NFL. Woody Strode, who later became a famous back. Woody Strode played one year, and he said, after playing in the NFL one year as the first African-American, if I've got to integrate, integrate heaven later on, I don't want to go. I mean, yeah, that's, that's rough. Mark? And with, and with Jackie Robinson, he had, to, he had to endure the fact that people were trying to spike him and slide into him hard, et cetera. Well, that's nothing compared to, I mean, football, every play, somebody's out to get you. And so he got late hits and punch and everything else. I mean, it was, and the referees often intentionally or unintentionally looking the other way. Strode and, and Kenny Washington went through was, was mighty bad. Jim Brown endured a lot of it too, but even that, even, even uh, then it was a little bit easier. When you were the first two players in the all white league with a lot of the players coming out of the players like Alabama and LSU, and they had license to give you those guys were brave. You you look at the league, and we've talked about we've talked about the early stages of the league. When did the league itself, Doctor, all of a sudden realize that they had the same vile prejudice that we have had in this country for so many years? And in what year did they decide to try and make a move to correct that attitude of prejudice in the NFL? Well, as I just outlined, the 46 was the year of change because in the wake of, of, of World War II and the pressures in Los Angeles, you know, the rest of the NFL owners, they didn't like it. George Preston Marshall, of course, was the most vehement against it. But uh, he, they had no choice because the, the Ram owners insisted and they persuaded the rest of the owners that of all the trouble that would, be, would come to them if they didn't change. So the, the World War II era marked the real time of transition, at least in, in, the, in, the, in the minds of people who counted. Uh, when, to, to ask the question, when did they realize they were just like the rest of the country? I think because they were acting so much in the rest of the country that the thought never even really occurred. To them. They never bothered to ask themselves the question. The only person who raised the thought about it, other than George Hallis, who was trying to argue a blatant lie that we didn't know, uh, Tex Schramm, who later became a, a, a leader of the Cowboys, he shrugged and honestly admitted, he said, you just didn't do it in those days which again gets back to that theme that Mr. Woodward talked about, capitulation. It's a nice way, sounding way of saying, you just went along with the worst among you. You just didn't do it. It sounds so nice. And a lot of mean things, nice language in our history. And you talk about 1946 as the year of uh, transition. And um, you spoke of Kenny Washington. And I found it interesting that um, at UCLA, he was a standout, probably the best player on that team, including uh, Jackie Robinson and Woody Strode. And it took him, I believe it was six or seven years after yeah. he graduated to get that that call up. And by that time, um, he was injured and, you know, not the same person. Right. Um, 
out of college and playing in, in the professional, do you think he could he have been one of the best of all time if he had been had he played uh, went right out of college? Of course, the, the what ifs you can't know for sure. Little doubt because right. one one element of evidence about this in 1939, when Washington was finishing at UCLA, you had a tradition in the 1960s. The NFL had what was called the college All Star Game before the NFL season. The All Stars of the pre previous college year who graduated, most of whom were try out in the pros, they would stage an All Star Game with the then reigning NFL champion. So and this lasted into the 1960s. And the point was in 1939, when you had this college all-star game against the NFL champion, Kenny Washington was named to the all-star team. He was a starter in the all-star team. He was a standout among the college players in this all-star game against the NFL pros. And yet he was the only player of the entire all-star squad of college of collegiate athletes who didn't have a pro contract. The best player didn't have a, a pro contract. So he certainly, certainly could have cracked the NFL about it. And barring injury, he would have been as a running back and and, and possibly a quarterback. He played in college in the single wing to some degree, and the tailback was a do-everything kind of player, and Ken Washington could, could do that. He could run, he could block, he could pass, and he could kick. So he could do everything. And what happened, he, he couldn't get a tryout for any team in the NFL. And so in the 40s, during the war years, he played for some semi-pro team on the West Coast, a team called the Hollywood Bears minor league pro football making just dollars a game, but he did it to, obviously to make money. And unfortunately in those five years, he busted up, busted up his knee a couple of times. And so he ended up coming into the NFL much older, 27 years old and already with bad knees. So he lasted a couple of years, but never amounted to anything great because he was too old and at that point already injured. There's still talk, some people say that he and Joe deserve some kind of mention in Canton as Hall of Fame, as Hall of Famers because of what they did, even if their careers weren't that, weren't that outstanding. It was 1953 before we had the first black quarterback, and that was Willie Thrower, who came into the league. And since then, we have had sporadic, and I'm talking through the years, black quarterbacks in the NFL. And so I have to feel that the attitude of Jim Crow still progressed so much further than we even think it did because, you know, 1953, first black quarterback, you think, okay, hey, we're going to let them run the team. Black athletes are smart enough. And let's be realistic. That really never has, I'm going to even say for today, Corey, never has gone beyond the level of the acceptance. Do you have any stories in your book about maybe the discrimination just against a position? with allowing black quarterbacks to be the man of power? That's very much part of the story that when, when integration occurred in the 40s, there's stories in different sports, it's better to give it in a broader context. In baseball, we had the situation once, once integration came, the phrase was never said in print, but the phrase was only that the bench was white. If you were good enough to make this, the starting team, you, you could play in the major leagues, but if you weren't quite good enough, Miners, the, the bench was white. This was a way of giving more more money and more, more contracts to, to to Anglo players. In the NFL, there was a there was a phenomenon that was nicknamed. It wasn't just quarterback. Quarterback was the most infamous, in, but the ingrained mentality among coaches and owners was that, with the final final acknowledgement coming, yes, these these guys are good enough to play, but they needed again to rationalize to themselves and the process the process of capitulation accompanying it. That there were certain positions for which African Americans were quote appropriate, and so you had running back, offensive tackle, defensive tackle, but there were no African -American linebackers, there were no African American free safeties, there were no African American centers, and there were no African American quarterbacks. The phrase was the middle of the field, and that dominated. I mean, came in, but the first starting quarterback really wasn't until Marlon Briscoe in 1967 with the Broncos. It was an even longer time than the 1950s. There are a few, a few American quarterbacks came in as replacement, George Talifer in Baltimore, uh, Jim Thrower, but no one really becoming a leader of the team at quarterback until Marlon Briscoe, at middle linebacker, 
for Willie Lanier with the Chiefs. So it took time for uh, positions that were, quote, mentally challenging positions for those to be around, with the contradiction, obviously, being that during the days of segregation, African-American schools like Grambling, Morgan, obviously African-Americans played all the positions. Duh. And so that the, uh, the situation, contradictions were simply ignored. And again, Mr. Marshall was the, the last of the, of the lot, finally in, 19, in the early 1960s, to, uh, to raise the uh, issue, of, to bring the, the, the cause of integration into Washington, D.C. And he did it kicking and screaming. And, and that mentality, you know, it still exists today, really. I mean, you have the marginalized citizens on the margins in, in professional football with those positions, because I can remember in my time growing up that there was Doug Williams and there was Vince Evans, then Randall Cunningham, but they all were the same type of player that didn't get the run. Um, and that mentality uh, is really one of those things that, I want, actually, I wanted to get to this later, but I guess I'll ask now. And I don't see, there's always one question that I never know how to ask, and this is it. So sorry, Mark. Um, sorry, doctor. And again, this is the show on sportsnetusa.net. Um, that mentality, um, we, we, we think it still exists. Mark and I think that mentality still exists. Where do you still see it existing in football and just in just sports in general? I think with with football, I mean the word sounds it sounds fancy, but that's I like it. The word is palimpsest. It means it's the word. It basically means a mental fingerprint. It's a, it's a habit of mind, a habit of the heart that remains in force that, tr that you can trace in, in a, not always in a seen way. And uh, I mean the the issue of African Americans playing at various positions still remains somewhat an issue. But although certainly the issue of quarterbacks linebacker this is long since broken down coaching staffs have, have changed though there's still haven't been quite as many head coaching jobs that have gone to african americans as many would like but that's broken down to a great degree it's more than now in many sports particularly in, in football among them front office owners general managers this has remained with some exceptions ozzy ozzy Newsom is certainly an example but ownership still hasn't come forth in uh, areas of, of professional sports. And many, many athletes, among them Jordan, Tiger Woods, have raised questions of African-Americans in fields of business who have been successful. You know, why aren't you stepping up and putting your money forward, become, becoming a part of the ownership that's there? Because you can't just, I want to be an owner and get appointed like a head coach. You have to have the, the cash to do it. There are African-Americans who have been enormously successful in many areas of business and many have been ch have been challenged but many more have need to take up the take up the issue in earnest and go forth at least that's the chance that's offered to them so there's still i think the sense of there being a kind of hovering cloud if you will that's the best, as i like to call it it's still there I mean, the, the quarterback issue has long been exploded. Nobody in their right mind is going to say African Americans quarterback can't play center, can't play middle linebacker. Goodness gracious! I mean, has anybody played the linebacker position better than Lawrence Taylor? Has anybody played quarterback uh, in the, in recent years as well as a number of players that are with, with Baltimore? With, right. Or since Doug Williams? I mean, goodness sakes! I mean, it's just uh, it's just too 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 obvious and too numerous a number of examples even to, ever, right. to, for anyone to try to dispute that. But ownership is still, I think, a kind of area where the apologists for the league, including Mr. Goodell, are a remain a little bit nervous about going there and discussing it because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it hasn't quite been kicked open. Right. And, and when we hit say a nerve, door, Dr. Dr. Levy, before you, you hit a nerve with Mark when you said, Lauren, has anybody played the linebacker position as well as Lawrence <laughs> Taylor? And that is a no. We are right here. The guy on the bottom, guy up top on your right side, the correct in that answer. So, Mark, I'll let you go ahead and ask this question. Is he a fan of Dick? Well, Buck? you know, that's <laughs> that, yeah. Oh, he brought up Dick Buckus. He brought up Jack Cam. We 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 can go back. It's hard to say who the great, best. Great great players both. Doctor I mean, again. Yeah. Who's better, Joe Lewis or yeah. Muhammad Ali? Debating different eras. Always fun. You can't yeah, resolve. Exactly. Exactly. 
in in looking at what's going on, and of course, when we talk about uh, Jim Crow, naturally we're talking about the black race that goes on. You brought up baseball more than once, and I think the prejudice in baseball has been something, unfortunately, that has rolled over to other races. I mean, I can remember many conversations and interviews I've seen with Roberto Clemente, probably one of the greatest baseball players of all time, that was he not only had prejudice held against him because nobody was sure if he was black, Cuban, Argentinian, and then they figured when he wasn't black, he must be a sub race below black. Is there that attitude in professional football for the Hispanic players and any Asian players that you may know in doing your research for your book? Well, the, I mean, you're absolutely right about Clemente. And uh, I mean, he was a black Puerto Rican. I mean, that's, that's very simple. He was, he was yeah. of African ancestry and he was regarded to be of that, of the, of the, of the black race himself that way, but also was of course, defiantly and proudly Hispanic. And that was part of his struggle. And the struggle of course was accentuated by the fact that he was, and ch was chided for it and was not comfortable with the chiding. He was chided about the fact that his English was very really good. Mm -hmm. uh, although I did interview one umpire, by the way, of years ago, who said that Clemente's English poor, except when he wanted to, to dispute an umpire's call. Then he was clear as a bell. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. But the, uh, that was just oh. one umpire's opinion. But the, uh, the issue of, of Hispanics, of course, with regard to, with regard to football, is a little bit uh, pushed to, to the side by the fact, of course, that American football is not, unlike in comparison to baseball, hasn't penetrated Latin playgrounds in the Caribbean and Mexico or in parts of, Latin, or parts of Central America the way that baseball did. You know, where's the, you know, Mani Sanguian from, uh, from Panama? Scores of players out of Cuba, out of Puerto Rico. You don't have that phenomenon quite as much in uh, in in, fo in football. You do have many Asians. Uh, Manu Tuyasasopo was a famous who played uh, for the university. Who came from Hawaii? He was Polynesian in his ethnicity, but he played for Seattle in in pro football. So there were some Asians and uh, and uh, and other ethnicities who have played in the NFL. It's more a matter of of the game in the local cultures and baseball in Japan, baseball in Korea, that's there. And so the, the beginnings of baseball players from those areas took time, came forth. Obviously, Matsui and others in the 90s and beyond have demonstrated that. But for, for, for football, again, because the obvious sport that has challenged the popularity of football, even in this, in this country, and has dominated elsewhere, of course, I mean, that is football everywhere else in the world, except in America by name. And so what we call football is not played quite as much. And other, other areas of the world, I mean, Canada, for example, of course, defiantly plays football, but it's their own kind, their own style, three downs, different rules, longer field, wider field. So it's slightly different. So American football is a little bit resistant, not intentionally, but inadvertently because of the locality, the more narrow locality of the geography in which the game is played. And, and, you know, I'm going to stay on that real quick. When uh, you talk, Mark, and you guys talk about the Hispanic um, football players, we had, had a chance to talk to uh, Drs. Mario Longoria and, and George Iber talking about Latinos in pro football. And one of the questions we asked them, and I'll ask you, um, when you're a Latino and when you're a, a Black player, does being a professional or being an athlete and being an activist, especially during Jim Crow era, does that go hand in hand in, in a requirement? or not necessarily a requirement, but does it go hand in hand? Well, in the older days, Jack Robinson was obviously, ex had so much part of the expectation that added more pressure to him was he was expected to lead well beyond the area of baseball and did. In a sense, he gave up his life for it because of all the pressures he endured and all the medical problems that ensued from there and his early days, very much an extension of that. Among the football players, the act was, it, it was there, but I don't think terribly much of it in, in any visible way until the, dec the decade of the 1960s. Football players came out in significant numbers at the point, for example, famous photograph when Muhammad Ali lost his title, called a meeting, Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar were there, but the rest of the crowd that was there for, in support of 
Ali, were all from the NFL. Willie Davis, Bobby Mitchell, so many others, and Jim Brown, of course, and the leader. So before Jim, there wasn't quite as much visibility of leadership in that regard. Uh, Brown was really, a, Jim Brown, I think, was really a, 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 a trailblazer when it came to mixing sports and him, what he was as an athlete was in his mind, and he said so, was a deeper, was but an extension of who he was as a human being. And so if he could go from from football field to Hollywood to politics, it was an extension of who he was, Jim Brown. I love the point with Jim Brown that can always be emphasized. There are folks from Long Island who will tell you that football was Jim Brown's second sport. He was the best lacrosse player of his day. It's, it's all an extent, and to him, it was all an extension of Jim Brown who he was and he, can, and he continues well well through his life i mean you're in the la area many people remember it was jim brown beyond his football days who personally went out and solved the conflict in the trips and the bloods in the streets of los angeles and stopped the killing he did that with people who didn't even know who he was a football player but just by sheer force of nature force of personality and who he was and i think you know jim brown and muhammad ali were unique in that regard and what each was as a political athlete, was an extension of the deeper self that was going to defend itself in whatever directions there were that made sense to them. And they were good friends as a consequence of it. And Mark, with Corey asking that question of heroes that, that have helped the cause, I mean, I, you know, when you look back at Jim Thorpe and everybody thought Pop Warner was the protector of Jim Thorpe as the truth comes out, Pop Warner really wasn't a lover of the American Indians. It was just the place he was at at Carlisle, and he berated them a great deal of the time. So I've got to ask, with a lot of the athletes that are out there, you talk about the black American hero in sports. Who is the white champion? And I, that's the best way to put it. The white champion in the NFL that came out and really stood up for the black players in the NFL. It's a good question. I mean, you don't have a situation of a famous incident. That some the factuality of it has been slightly disputed, but Red Barber says it was the, 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 the situation in Cincinnati when Pee Wee Reese walked on the field with the fans in Cincinnati booing Robin booing the Dodgers in 1947, and Pee Wee Reese walking across the field and putting his arm around Jackie Robinson, saying, "This is my friend," and this is Pee Wee who was from next door to Cincinnati, and that served no. The fans and on the league that you know this this man can stay and he is part of this team. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to think as I race through the different years when anybody stood up in this way. There were a, a team that I can reflect on the history of a little more directly because I knew it growing up. The Baltimore Ravens certainly brought it. They were one of the best teams of the late 1950s, of course, champion in 59, and they were open in the way that they brought in and had a, a, a very large number of genuinely star players who were African-American. Parker on the offensive line, Lenny Moore in the back, offensive backfield, Big Daddy Lipscomb, Gene as a defensive lineman, Moore and now in the Hall of Fame. Uh, so that you had players that came forward and other African other players on the team went out to go out of their way to, to befriend them. They were attempting not for the sake of politics so much as for the sake of the, the quality of play of the team, the morale, the, the camaraderie, that they could stand up to any opposition unified. Older players like Gino Marchetti and Arthur went out of their way to make sure that uh, folks like Parker and Moore were uh, not, not given any kind of short shrift, not given separate seating on the bus or the back of the plane, et cetera. So the team worked that way, but more as a matter by choice. But among any any players who were outspoken in their direct efforts, I suppose the only person uh, wasn't a player, but the, the person who comes to mind as being direct and outspoken in regard to change in general and progressive attitudes would, would be then the uh, the Raiders Al Davis. He was outspoken in regard to any kind of nonconformity with with respect to any old taboos that were there to be, and he was a pain in the blank to the uh, to the. Leader. He and Brozell didn't like each other, but he got away with it. Right. And it involved a certain level of uh, underhanded play as well. His famous statement, just win, baby. So that if, you're, if, you're, if your thumb was broken, as the offensive lineman Bob Browns was, 
tape it up a whole bunch. So not only is it not going to hurt you when you play, but you can use it as a club, which is illegal. But go ahead and smack your opponent. In the <laughs> Cheating is encouraged in that sense. So Al Davis would break the rules, both for, for good and bad. And so Al Davis, the pioneer, I think would be the, that would be the example that most clearly comes to mind among whites who was saying to heck with the old ways. The new ways are better. And it's better not only to explore the new ways, but also to defy the old ways and put them to bed. Not have it, not say rest in peace, but to, but rest. that was Al Davis's right. attitude towards the old ways. So that, I think that's still going on. Certainly, there when you compare, you know, the obvious counterpoint in politics in the 1960s, compare the generosity, the even-handed, uh, good spirit of Martin Luther King versus the anger of Malcolm X. You can still ask students always, you know, who, who's wrong? Who's to say? But the question is, what resonated in whose hearts? And the the anger that's there in Malcolm X was was simply the anger of a lot of people. And it can't be denied. And so he had a following as well. And uh, so the, the, the resonation of that kind of anger that Jim Brown in football represented is something that in, in counterpoint, Al Davis then could take up and say, let's run with it. And let's look at the, let's look at the old guard and say, not only are you no longer in charge, we're not even gonna give you any kind of good manners and deference to your old age, to heck with you. It worked. <laughs> And you, you talk about the these these personalities, and, and I found it interesting in your book. You talk about there's there's different personalities that shape the game of football and shape you know football during this era. And it was a uh, and remember this book, tackling Jim Crow, um, racial segregation in uh, professional football, chapter eleven of the book. <laughs> and we're talking to this author, professor of history at Slippery Rock University, Alan Levy, chapter eleven when it discusses. Um, the death of Eugene Big Daddy Lipscomb and uh, the fall of Marion Motley. And it was interesting. It might be my favorite chapter of the book because it discusses what they went through and, and the highs and definite lows of what they went through. Yeah. Can, can you discuss that with, uh, with our audience and, and um, sure. just how yeah. important Gene it, was, Lipscomb, it, was, it was strong? Gene Lipscomb was an outstanding athlete outstanding football player, came from a very harsh background. He grew up in Detroit. Father was never around. His, his mother uh, died when he was stabbed to death, bus stop in Detroit. So he had to move in with a, uh, with a relative of the family. The relative insisted that he pay rent. So he had to work at night while he was going to school in order to earn the money to pay the rent. But he simply as a, as a high school athlete, went to school, went to sports, worked, and so it required time to sleep. Went without sleep, weeks on end sometimes. Had no money to go to college, played in the obscurities of the uh, high school leagues of Detroit, and from there, the Marines. While he was in the Marines, he was in the notice of the press because he was stationed at a uh, Marine base camp in, in, in the LA area. And he, he gained the notice in his, play, in his playing for that for the Marine base football team of a, of a scout of the Los Angeles Rams then, who was none, none other than Pete Rozell. And so Rozell signed the Rams. He was thereafter soon traded to Baltimore, where he was outstanding. While he played for Baltimore, what became known to reporters was the fact that the, uh, the Colts did use, as many teams did, they used painkillers for many of their star players if they got nagging injuries out on the field despite being injured during a game. One writer who worked for the Baltimore Sun said that he was convinced that uh, Big Daddy was called, that Big Daddy was probably turned into a medical junkie without, without the team realizing it because of pain. You know, he, was, he was an astonishingly good player. He weighed 300 pounds, and he was faster than any, any running back on the team except Lenny Moore. And many, many stories about, just to tell you one, that uh, Tom Moore, running back with the Packers, recalled he was, he, they ran a play where he had Bart Starr faking to Moore, he would run, pretend to run into the line and then pass, run into the, into the, out for a pass with hopefully nobody picking him up. Big Daddy knows, noticed what was going on. So Bart Starr threw the ball to Tom Moore, who was a fast man. What, what player was running after Tom Moore knocked the pass down? Big Daddy, a, a defensive tackle, running down running back from behind on a pass play. That's how fast and fast, how quick he could diagnose a play. He was traded to Pittsburgh, but in, in the context of all this, playing game after game, taking taking drugs to keep the pain down, 
we don't know how it happened or why it started, but they think it only, medical experts think it'll probably only happen, only happened two times. He lived in the get in the downtown area of Baltimore. And one night in March of 1962, ended up in a hospital and died of an overdose of heroin. They only noticed two needle marks on it. The team doctor of the, of the Colts always swore up and down that Big Daddy couldn't have taken much heroin because he, was, you know, he said he was always afraid of needles. But it was a case of going from a, in a hard, harsh background to a life where he accepted the painkillers, as most did in those days, on to a life with, again, the pain of playing football goes on and on and on as you get older. The injuries get, get, get last longer, the pain is longer. And so perhaps he turned to heroin as a way of uh, dealing with the pain. But the second shot, apparently, that he took in March of 62 turned out to be what was called a supercharger. That's what, what was diagnosed by the doctors. Just a much more pure form than is uh, generally on the street. So he was taking, in effect, 10 doses at one time, and the overcharge killed him. And so Big Daddy, at age 32, was no more. It's a great, just a, a, a life that started in tragedy, gained glimmers of hope through pro football, but was surrounded constantly by pain and ended pre grossly prematurely and in great pain and suffering as well. So that's, you know, there's that underside, if you will, the negative side to the stories of integration in the lives of people, as is the case in music with Charlie Parker, or Billie Holiday, mm -hmm. they have all walks of life. Uh, it's, it's a presence that's there. It doesn't as much it should because it's a lesson obviously to be learned by anybody who's even thinking of dabbling in such matters don't go there uh, very simple easy to easier much easier to say than to make happen but the same thing and the, in regard to Marion Motley again injured a great injured a great deal as he got older and uh, pretty much cast aside Paul Brown after after several years uh, when he was leading the league and running and playing unselfishly, he was the best running back in football and also the best linebacker at the same time in his, in his own day. Uh, but uh, with the pain from the, from the years of playing, was never able to uh, build up much in the way of, uh, of alternatives in regard to what he could do in, with his life. Wasn't necessarily in business as, as other players have been. Many players have had that problem, investing money badly. But uh, tried all, all, all sorts of activities in the realm of coaching, tried to be a coach in, the, in an attempt early on to have a women's professional football league. Didn't work. His, and uh, so he never became a success in any, in any major element of his life financially after football. And so he lived very much in obscurity and you can't say in abject poverty, but he cer certainly was not comfortable in the years of his life. That, that remain, of course, is a problem for many athletes because, of course, you, as usual, athletes, as they get older, tend to have more medical issues because of all the contact sports that they played earlier in life. And when they don't have adequate health plans, as the players of that era were left with uh, in the early days of, of, in, of integration and before there were major unions and, and medical, medical coverage, they were left on their own. And uh, Motley's sad ending and sad ending in, of, relative, of relative poverty is but one of many consequences in that regard. The, real, the difference with Motley is he fell from such a height of being the greatest player to being one of the poorest. So it is a sad story, but it's, it's part of the story that has to be there. Ignore it. Being a professor of history, I've got to ask you, how many times in your history class do you refer to, I know you've written multiple sports books. Do you use sports and use sports as an analogy to history in general? Because Corey Nalen, who teaches a sports class, will always say what happens with sports very much reflects society. So I've got to ask you as a history professor, how many times you take sports, use it in history and say, hey, sports, entertainment and everything else, they reflect each other. Before I let you go as a history professor, Dr. Alan Levy. Yes, I, when I teach, actually there's one course I teach is, ent is entitled uh, sports and music in American society. And I use sports and music as, as a metaphor for the different eras in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and beyond. So in one course, the answer is, how often do I use sports? Every day. Generally, in the uh, courses that I teach in American history, I cover uh, a wider range of topics, of course, but try to w weave the angle of sports into the, into the, into the, into the discussion out of uh, two, three classes a week, once a week. 
Uh, students may get tired of it, but most of them perk up, particularly as I live in Pennsylvania, want to make references to the Steelers or the Pirates. Uh, they like that. One, uh, one, one point that I raised gets back to the era of segregation. I always ask the trivia question, what was the name of the Pittsburgh professional football team in 1943? The answer was it was the Pennsylvania Steagles because the, the Steelers and the Eagles didn't have enough players to, to, uh, individually to form a team. The lesson being, of course, they could have taken African-American athletes, but rather than do that, they played as one team together. They hated each other. They got more fights during practice than they did anywhere else. <laughs> disbanded after them. But they, were, they preferred to stay as a single team rather than let African-Americans into the squad. That was how ensconced the issue of segregation was in 1943. Just wow. one example. Yeah. That's, so, that's almost as hypocritical as the Washington Redskins, now the Washington team, were the last team in the NFL to bring in a black professional football player, yet they use a Native American team's name, which can't be more racist than you can think of. I just find that amazing, too, that that sort of worked hand in hand. Well, that's again, that's the word that I've always, that I like to use, palimpsest. I mean, Marshall is long gone. And he was forced to against his wishes by during the Kennedy administration, Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall compelled the issue when they were building what became RFK Stadium. Mm -hmm. Udall just said, you're not in that stadium unless you integrate. You can build your own stadium if you want, but I, I can't stop you from doing that. So he, he, he finally broke down. But his resistance and the sense of the, of, the, of the team being his team and still having that ghost in the past, if you will, still lingers yeah. on. In the, uh, on to the name Redskins perhaps has an, is an extension of the notion that certain traditions we like to hold on to just because we have them and you can't take them away. Uh, so that uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with, but uh, it certainly is not something that uh, ne needs to be lamented terribly long. The name Redskins, the team has a proud past in various ways, not because of the name, but because of who played for them, like Doug Williams, like Larry Brown, and so many others. Right. Uh, those Hall. traditions are, are certain. Sam Huff, certainly. Sonny Jurgensen, all, all deserving of great praise, all in Canton. And the, uh, so the team has a history, but let them come up with a better name. And the, uh, the patterns will, con will continue on. And let's hope we can get to finally to a world where we do judge by not by the color of our skin, but by the content of character. We agree. Well, we definitely agree. Alan, thank you very much. Dr. Alan Levy, this is the book, Tackling Jim Crow. Racial Segregation and Professional Football, a very good read. And, and it's a quick read because you'll get in, in you, you know, you'll get enthralled in it. You, you will love the book. So, Alan, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure, sir. Anytime. All right. Okay. Well, we'll hold you to that, actually. So we, we talk a lot, so we'll hold you to that. Uh, for Alan Levy, Mark Pavlovich, Ed Ford, thanks for getting us up and running. I'm Corey Nalen, And once again, you've been watching the show on sportsnetusa.net.